what we're going to talk about today is in Python, how operators in the math module operate together. So number one, operators are essentially your arithmetic operators or anything that we're asking the CPU to do on our behalf. So we give it operands like 10 plus 2, and the operation itself is the plus operation. So the operand being 10, then the 2, and then we operate on those 10 and 2 by adding them together. And so that's what we're going to look like today. We also want to see how we can actually manipulate data types. For example, I showed you on the last video what would happen if I added two strings together, like 17 plus 29. If 17 is a string and 29 is a string, we're going to get 1729. Essentially, it does what's called a concatenation, where it puts the two strings together. However, sometimes we want to input something from the user. And that was another thing, is anytime we input something from the user, we always get a string. Well, what if we want to add two numbers? We say, hey, user, give me one number. Hey, user, give me another number. And we add those two things together. We can't do that unless there's some mechanism where we can change the data types. And I'll show you how to do that, how we convert data types in Python. So the objectives of this lecture are to understand how to perform simple mathematic operations, be able to get an element or range of elements from a list or dictionary, be able to convert one data type to another, understand operator precedence in Python. So that's fairly straightforward because if you're used to your math operations, it's still parentheses, power, or exponent, multiply, divide, add, subtract, the please excuse my dear Aunt Sally principle. Understand how to import and use the math module. So there's a lot of operators that aren't intrinsic to the Python language. So instead what we do is somebody else wrote how to do the sign how to take cosine, how to do the tangent, that sort of stuff. And so we can use the math module to actually use that code that somebody else wrote for us. Otherwise, we would be required to write all that code ourselves using just these primitive intrinsic operators such as plus, minus, subtract, or uh, modulo, divide, multiplication, that sort of stuff. So what you're looking at on your screen right now is how to convert data types. So I've got several examples here where A equals N 10.75. Well, hopefully in the back of your mind, you see the 10.75 and you're thinking to yourself, that's a float because it is, because there's that decimal there. Even if that decimal was a decimal zero, it's still going to be a floating point number. Well, integers can only store the whole portion of a number. So if I convert A from 10.75 as a float into an integer, we're going to get the value 10. It does what's called truncation. Notice it didn't round it to 11, it gave us 10. It just stored the whole portion of the number. It just completely disregarded what was to the right hand side. So if this was 10.9999999, we would still get 10. The only way to get 11 is if the whole portion of the number was 11. And so int, notice it looks like the print, except we leave off the P and R. And so what we do is what we put inside parentheses, we're going to temporarily convert into an integer for that statement. And so for this one, we're going to temporarily convert 10.75, which is a float, into an integer and store that converted value into A, which gives us the value 10. And so if we look at the first line, we can see 10 is the output of it, and it is indeed an integer. So all of these work. So int is not spelled out as integer. It's just int, the first three letters of it. Float is spelled out as F-L-O-A-T for float. S-T-R is for string. Um, and there's some other ones that you can use, bool, B-O-O-L. And that will try to convert it into true or false. And typically what it does is anything that's zero is false. Anything non-zero, positive or negative number, is true. And that's how Python works. So the important part to know here is take a look at line three, where I say C equals int, and then I have a string 200. So Python is smart enough that if I give it a string and I want to convert to an integer, it converts string. Remember, a string is in this case is just two followed by a zero followed by a zero. So that's three characters. But what Python is going to do, because it sees that we want to convert that into an integer, it's going to actually take the first zero, multiply it by one, because that's the ones place, take the second zero, multiply it by 10, add those two together, so we get zero, zero, and then take the two and multiply it by 100, because that's the 100's place, and add all three of those together, and we're going to get the value 200. And so Python is smart enough to figure that out. Now, it is relatively an expensive operation, because we have to take the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, things like that. And so if we look at line four, where we actually have decimals, now we have to take the one tenths place, the one one hundredths place, the one one thousandths place, things like that. And so these can be fairly expensive operations if we're doing them over and over and over again. And so if you find yourself trying to convert strings, try to find little shortcuts where you don't have to keep converting the same string over and over and over again. So that's how we convert data types. Essentially, we put the data type name, add parentheses in that whenever we want to convert temporarily. Now, notice we don't say int 10.75. We say a equals 10.7 or int 10.75. Because we temporarily convert 10.75 into an integer, we're not actually changing the value of 10.75. And so what we do is we say, okay, here's your 10.75. We want an integer back. Well, it looks at the 10.75. 
goes over here, grabs a 10, makes that into a 10, and returns that back to us. So we still have the 10.75 is the literal, but we also now have a 10. And so that's the important thing to notice here, that we have to set something equal to it if we want the value back out of it. We can't just say float 200 and expect that 200 to become a float. It's not going to do that. It returns to us the actual value that, re that we requested. So let's take a look at some of the operators that are available to us in Python. So in Python, there's a lot of operators that we're not going to use. They're called bitwise operations. That's this less than, less than sign, greater than, greater than sign. That's the left shift, right shift operation. The single and percent, that's the logical and, the pipe and the caret. We're not gonna use many of these, but the ones I wanna draw your attention to are the plus, the minus, the star, the double star, the front slash, the double front slash, and the percent sign. Those are the ones we're going to use most often. And then when we get into loops and conditions, we're gonna start doing the less than sign, greater than sign, where we actually compare two numbers or two strings or something like that. And the important thing to notice here is, notice the assignment operator was a single equal sign but our comparison operator is gonna be a double equal sign. And I, I make that abundantly clear through all the lecture size. So I have this little table right here that is in operator precedence order. So the very first thing is parentheses. So whatever's in parentheses is gonna get done first. Exponent, multiplication, division, floor division, modulo, addition, subtraction, assignment. So the assignment operator is the last thing. The single equal sign is the last thing that happens. And so whenever we see an equal sign, it has to do everything on the right hand side fix that into one single value, and then we can assign that into the variable on the left-hand side. So the important thing to know here is there is actually an exponent operator, and that's the double star. And so if we take a look at how this runs, let's go into Python here. If I say a equals two, b equals, let's say four, I can say print a star star v. And what that's going to do is it's going to raise two to the fourth power, because a is the value two, b is the uh, value four. So if we run this, you notice it comes through and it gives us the value 16. Well, two to the fourth is two times two times two times two, which is the value 16. Four times four gives us 16. And so the double star gives us exponent, whereas the single star gives us multiplication. And so whenever we multiply four by two or two by four, whatever you wanna say, it's going to give us the value eight. Now the important thing to know here is we have two different divisions. We have what's called floor division, where it's also known as integer division, or we just have the divide. So a and b are both integers. We can double check that by using that type. But let's go ahead and divide a by b, and let's go ahead and initialize c with its value. That way there we can take c and actually check the type of c. So let's double check and see what this is going to be. So we know this is gonna be two divided by four, or one half, or 0.5. So let's take a look at what this is going to give us. So notice it gives us 0 0.5. Even though a is an integer, b is an integer, we divided an integer by an integer and we got a float. So that's what the single equal sign does. It allows us after dividing integers to get an actual float. Otherwise, if this was two integers, we'd get the value of zero because that's the whole portion of the number. Well, if we want that behavior, we can use the double forward slash. The double forward slash is the floor, also known as integer division. Because I have an integer on the top and an integer on the bottom, it will divide those two and give you the whole number portion only. So let's take a look at what this does. So once again, take a look at what the last result, the single forward slash did. It gave 0 0.5 in a class of float. But if I use the double forward slash, I get zero, which is the whole number portion of 0 0.5, and it gives me an integer back. Sometimes this is the desired operation, and it always just comes down to what logic do you want to do. And we'll, we'll have some examples of when we use the double forward slash versus the front, front single front slash, because it's sort of makes sense that, well, heck, the single forward slash always gives me the correct result. But sometimes that's not what we want it to do. And we'll look at what that looks like in later lectures. So let's go back to our lecture here. Modulo might not be something, but modulo does division. So whenever we divide, we get two results from the CPU, from the computer. In there, we get a quotient and a remainder. We get both. So whenever we do the forward slash, the single forward slash, we just take the quotient portion and we disregard the, the remainder portion. Whenever we do the, the percent side, the modulo, we take the divisor or we divide the two, we get the quotient and the remainder, but we discard the quotient and just save the remainder. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We have two divided by four. And so I say C equals A percent B. Now this is gonna give me an integer, and let's take a look at what this gives us. It gives us the value two. So in this case, two divided by four is zero with a remainder of two. Well, let's do this a little bit differently. Let's say 14 divided by four. Obviously four does not divide evenly into 14, it does for 16, but not for 14. So let's take a look at what we're gonna have remaining here. So notice if we divide 14 by four, we can obviously divide that 
three times gives us the value 12. If we subtract 12 from 14, we get the value two. So this is the number remaining after division. So I'm not trying to teach you math here, I assume you know that, but I just wanted to show you how it's going to look in Python. Okay, we know we're gonna get the quotient and the remainder, but how do I discard one and the other and how do I grab those? And it's by using the operator, either the percent sign or the forward slash. Remember, forward slash gives you the quotient, percent sign gives you the remainder. Addition and subtraction is exactly like you would expect. If I do it A plus B, that's going to give me, in this case, 18, because it's going to add 14 plus 4. Now, remember in the lecture slides, if I added double quotes here, that makes these, instead of integers, strings. And so if I added these two together, let's see what I'm going to get. Notice you get 144 because it's a class of strings. So what it's going to do is it doesn't see that it's the value 14. It sees it's that it's character 1 followed by character 4. And then B is just the character 4. So if I add two strings together, I can catenate them. I just sandwich them together. And because I put A first plus B, 14 is going to come first followed by the last 4. And so it's very important you understand what your data types are. So let's go ahead and temporarily convert these just to show you that int actually does work here. So what this is going to do is inside the parentheses of int, we have the value 14 as a string. And so what that's going to do is Python is going to convert that by multiplying 4 by 1, adding that to 1 times 10. And so that's essentially how it goes through there, because it takes the 1's place, multiplies it whatever digits there, goes to the 10's place, multiplies 10 by whatever digits there. So we're going to get the value 14 as an integer. And the same thing happens for line 2, b equals int string 4. What that's going to do is convert that 4 from a character into an integer, which is going to be the value 4. So hopefully in the back of your mind, you're expecting on line 4 that we're going to add integer 14 with integer 4, and we're going to get an integer back that should be the value 18. So notice whenever we didn't put the ints there, we got 144 as a class of string. Whenever we did put the ints there, we got the value 18 as a class of integer. And so that does exactly what we want to. The reason this is important is because the input, when I'm reading data from the user, input always gives me a string. And so I have to have some sort of way. For example, if I say, give me a number, they're gonna give me a number, one four, but that's gonna be string one followed by the character four. And so using the int or float, whatever it happens to be, we can actually convert what the user gives us into whatever data type we want. Now, some conversions we cannot do. So if I said int a as a string, or let's just put John and Jane or something like that. So Python still has to figure out, okay, how am I gonna convert John into an integer? And unfortunately it can't. So what we're gonna get is what's called a value error. It's looking for a base 10. It's like, uh, I don't know how to convert John into a base 10 number because those aren't digits that I can work with. Well, let's take a look at if I did something like one John. Okay, even that, it still sees that that one, yes, I can convert the one, but because J-O-H-N is in there, it's not a full integer. So that's the thing about an input. If I add spaces, I'm gonna get the full content as a string, but I still need to narrow down just the integer portion if I want Python to convert it for me. Otherwise, you are forced to convert it yourself. So operator precedence, I'm not gonna to cover too much. You can just see, based on this chart, Parentheses comes first, exponent, multiply, division, and so on and so forth. Assignment operator is the last thing to occur, which is exactly what we would expect. If in doubt, add parentheses. That's essentially the, the rule of thumb. <laughs> so we covered floor division. Now the important thing about floor division is that if A and B are both floating point numbers, let's take a look at what happens with floating point division. Let's say we have 10.7 divided by 2.0. Do A divides divides B. Remember, that's the floor division. Whenever I had four or two divided by four, whenever we did this, we got the value zero as an integer. And now we have two floats. So let's see what happens. Notice I get 5.0 as a float. So even though it, even, it doesn't evenly divide because we have this 10.7, what it's going to do is divide the two and then still, and it's going to carve out what's to the right-hand side of the decimal. Essentially, it looks something like this. So what it does is it first converts those into integers, and then after it divides them, it converts whatever that result is back into a float. And so you can see that 10 divided by 2 is 5.0, but 10.7 divided by 2 is not. And so it performs integer division, but it still gives me a decimal of 0. So it's the floor division at this point. So it takes the floor of whatever result we got, and then gives us back a floating point number. So it is important to know what data types are coming in, so your inputs, and what data 
types are coming out. That way that you can keep up with it. Because remember, if it's a string, weird things start happening where we can get a instead of add. And so it's very important you understand what data types they are. And that's why I showed you, always use type right here if you're uncertain what data type it is. So if you're trying to debug your code and something's going wrong, always take a look at the types. Make sure that they match what you expect them to be. So let's take a look a little bit farther down here. We have what's called the ranging operator. So we talked about all these operators that we have here. Now a range produces a range of values as sort of like a list. And so if I said something like a equals range 10 to 20, there are three different ways we can specify this. If I only specify one number, that's gonna give me a range from zero to nine. So it's gonna give me 10 total numbers starting with zero. So they give me zero through nine. If I specify two numbers, right here, 10 comma 20, it's gonna start at 10 and end at 19. And so we have 10 total numbers, so 20 minus 10, we have 10 total numbers. And so you can think of it as the starting point is inclusive, whereas the stopping point is exclusive. That's why we get 10 through 19. So in here, if I was to say A itself, we're going to get what's called a range type. And it's not very helpful. You can see it just says range 10 comma 20. Okay, good. Well, we can actually use it sort of like a list. So I could say A, sub two. And what that'll do is give me a third element. Remember, all indices start at zero. So the zero element should be 10, one element should be 11, two element should be 12. So let's take a look at what occurs. Okay, and we get the value 12. And basically all this it does is produces a list. And in fact, we could say I want a list off of that. Okay, and we can convert this thing into the list just to see what occurs. And we get a list of 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So just like int, just like str, float, and stuff like that, list is a way to change an object, in this case, a range, into an actual list. And you can see it actually produces the list, something that we would want 10 through 19. And finally, if we specify one more, comma two, that's what's called the step. And so we're gonna get values from 10 to 19, but each value is gonna be, in this case, two apart. And so as you saw with nothing there, they're one apart, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So let's take a look at what happens when they're two apart. So notice we get 10, 12, those are two apart. 14, that's two apart, 16. And notice 19 doesn't even show up. 20 doesn't even show up. So we get 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. Once again, this is the starting point, it's inclusive. 20 is the stopping point, it's exclusive. And then this is what's called the step. We can leave any of these off except for the starting point. I'm sorry, the first value. So that's the important thing to know here is if we specify the first value, it could be the ending point or the starting point depending on whether we add one other value. So for example, if I say range 10, it's gonna give me all values zero through nine. So that's the stopping point. However, if I added another number, 10 comma 20, now that 10 is no longer the stopping point, it's now the starting point. And so if we run our Python, we get 10 through 19. And so it's important to know what this operator is actually doing. And this is a great way because otherwise, if I didn't have the range function, I'd have to say something like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And that's how I would have to build my list. And it's not the easiest thing in the world. So we can just say range 10 through 20, that gives me tw uh, 10 values in this case, 10 through 19. And as a list, if we change it using this typecasting list. So it goes to show you that not only can we have integers, strings, things like that, we can actually convert ranges into lists. Okay, let's talk about slicing. So slicing is a way, everything we've done up till now, we've grabbed a single value from a list, a dictionary, and stuff like that. So let's go in here, we have A as a list. Let's go ahead and print out just so you can see what the list looks like. In this case, we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Now if I said A sub zero, that's obviously gonna give me the value 10. It's gonna give me the first element in there. If I said two, it's gonna give me 12, the third element in there. And that's why we get 12. Well, what if I wanted to narrow this down and get the values 11, 12, and 13? Well, I can do that using what's called a slice. And so it still uses the subscript operator, the square brackets, except now we're gonna use a colon to denote a starting point and an ending point. And so in this case, our starting point, we want 11. So that's index one and we want 12 and 13. So 11 is index one, 12 is index two, 13 is index three. So here, I'm gonna put three, but don't be fooled yet. I did one through three and notice I got 11 and 12. Just like the range function, the slice function is exclusive on the end. So notice that the one, which is the value 11, has been given to me. If 
However, three is exclusive, so we only get indices one and two, which is 11 and 12 respectively. So if I want 12, I would put the value four here. So notice that four is exclusive, so I get values of index one, which in this case is 11, index two, which in this case is value 12, and index three, which in this case is value 13. And so it's very important to understand that, okay, if I use the slice, I think of it like the range operator. Starting point is inclusive, whereas the stopping point is exclusive. Now there's some shortcuts we can make with this. So I'm gonna leave this print up there, and show you what happens if we just specify an ending point. Well, what that's going to do is it's going to start at the very beginning of the list. So we get all values up to in including 13. So notice if I have one com or colon four, we get 11, 12, and 13. If I have nothing there, it's assumed to be the value zero. And so notice if I put zero here instead, we should get the exact same list. And so it's just a shortcut. You could put zero in there if you want. If you don't want to, you could just leave it off. Typically, most Python programmers just leave it off. The same thing can be said on the opposite direction. And so if I specify one here and then nothing on the end, that assumes we want to start at index one and go all the way to the end of the list, which the last value of the list is the value 19. Notice we skip 10 because that's index zero. Once again, the starting point is inclusive, whereas the stopping point is exclusive. And so I've got your slicing here on a table. The last thing I wanna cover is the negative numbers. And so what I can do, even on a slice or even not on a slice, I can say negative two. So if I have a negative number as an index, it's gonna start at the very back of the list. And let's take a look at what negative two is going to give me. If I do negative two, it gives me the value of 18. So in this case, negative one would give me the first element from the back of the list. Negative two gives me the second element from the back of the list. Notice that we specify zero, that's the start of the list, one, so if it's a positive value, we start at the beginning of the list. Whereas if it's a negative number, we start at the end of the list. So let's talk about the last thing, which is the math module. So the math module includes code that somebody has already written for us. We just wanna import it and use it. And so I used here in this lecture slides, the dir, it stands for directory, and it shows you all the different things that belong to the math module. Now the math module, because somebody else wrote it for us and it's not intrinsic to the Python language, we have to do what's called import math. Okay, so import says, I want you to reach out and grab something that somebody else wrote for me. Now math comes with all Python distributions, so you should be fine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna print dir math, just to show you once again what that's going to produce. We imported math, and now we have access to all these functions here. Because I use the import, there's a different way to import, which I do not want you to use, where you can say from math import star. You'll see that a lot, but I don't want you to do that because with math, it's now self-contained in something called a math namespace. So if I wanted to access the cosigners or GCD or pi, I would have to do math dot in front of all of those. And so notice on my IDE here, all those different functions popped up. So if I want the value pi, I would have to do math dot pi. Because if I did just simply pi, Python has no idea what we're talking about there. Okay, so notice I got a name error with pi, but math.py printed out 3.14159 and so on and so forth. So that's how I like you to import your modules. Whenever I do import math, everything that I want to use from the math library now has to be prefixed with math.math. Math okay, so there are multiple things we could do with the math library. Most of our geometric or trigonometric functions are located inside, but we can also, you see that floor, factorial, Things like that are also reproduced for. Some of these things are actually like ceiling um, powers, even though we have an operator for power. So let's just take a look at print math, let's say two to the eighth. We actually have an operator that performs that for us. So the reason they did this is take a look at math.pow, notice that it gives us a float, number one. But the reason they did this is for backwards compatibility. Now, used to, Python a long time ago decided, hey, so like C++, all those other languages do not have an intrinsic operator for powers. However, in Python, we use them all the time, so they actually have an intrinsic operator to star star. The double star tells you raise two to the eighth power in this case. But for backwards compatibility, or the, for those coming from a C++ Java background, they offer it also in the math. I would recommend you use the intrinsic operator, the star star, because it's easier to use number one, plus we don't have to import the math library to use it. Uh, there's other functions in there. There's Euler's number, there's exp, which is e raised to whatever exponent you want. There's absolute values, 
arc cosines, arc sines, and things like that that you can see all inside here. And so that's essentially the math library. And in the math library, you're just really going to have to play around with it. So I've added a lot of references to the bottom of the lecture, just so you can see all the different things that the mathematical functions include. So here's the documentation. We always prefix it with math dot. That's if you use import math, which I would recommend. And it tells you exactly what it's going to return. Here are the parameters. Here's what it's going to do for you. And so I would recommend you take a look at this. Just be familiar with the different functions that the math library gives us access to. Number one is mainly trigonometric, flowing point, factorial, floor, ceilings, that sort of stuff. So it's not all the weird math functions that we're going to use. We're going to use what's called NumPy, N-U-M-P-Y, and that has all those scientific mathematical formulas that we're going to need in the future. But for now, that is your operators. That is the math module. And that is how to slice range. So let's double check to make sure we got all of our learning objectives out. So understand how to perform simple mathematical operations. Well, assuming we know that it's an integer float, we can use plus, minus, divide, double divide. And that's essentially right here, all of your different operators that you can use. Let's take a look at be able to get an element or range of elements from a list or dictionary. So you saw we can get a single element by using the subscript operator. We can get a range of elements by using the slicing operator. The slicing operator has the colon. Remember, inclusive is the starting point, exclusive is the ending point. Be able to convert one data type to another. We've done that by just simply saying whatever data type we want, and then inside parentheses, what data type we want to temporarily convert. Remember, if I said int, so for example, in this case, if I said something like a equals 10.2, if I said int a, it's not going to convert a into an integer. It doesn't actually modify a itself. If I wanted to change a into its integer, I'd have to say a equals int a. So hopefully everybody understands that just by putting int a, the a inside the parentheses, it actually doesn't change a. It looks at the value of a and then returns the integer, in this case, value of a. So if I did print a right here, actually let's just leave it. Just to show you, we still get 10.2. It actually did not convert it. But if I said a equals int a, then we get the value 10, the integer version of 10.2. And then finally, let's see, operator precedence, that's in the table, and then understand how to import and use the math module. Import math, and then if we wanna use it, it's math dot. And that's actually what's kind of nice about this documentation right here, is it'll put the math dot, just very small right there, just so you don't forget, hey, this is part of the math library, you probably should put math dot in front of it if you wanna use it. So for example, if I wanted to do, the absolute value of negative 77.4. Okay, notice we put math dot in front of it, then FABS, that stands for floating point absolute value. We run this and we get the value 77.4, the absolute value. And that is exactly how we run these mathematical functions. So let's double check, make sure once again, we have all our learning objectives met, which we do. And so that takes care of operators in the math module. Thanks for watching.